welcome. Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending today. Uh, my name is Kaylee Hennessy. I'm the assistant director here at Abigail Ogilvie Gallery in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we are so excited to be joined in conversation today with Pell Cass and Annie Armstrong, who are here to talk about Pell's current solo exhibition here at Abigail Ogilvie Gallery, um, Crowded Fields. So just to give you a brief background on our panelists today, Pell Cass is a photographer based in Brookline, Massachusetts, and one of his most recent series, Crowded Fields, currently on view, um, showcases constructed compositions of entire sporting events out of sequence, but still existing in one photograph. Um, Pell's work has graced the cover of Boston Art Review and is featured in the collections of the Fogg Art Museum, the Addison Gallery of American Art, the Polaroid Collection, the Decordova Museum, the Peabody Essex Museum, and the MFA Houston. Um, and then we are also joined today by Annie Armstrong. She is a writer based in Brooklyn, New York, originally from Atlanta, Georgia. She has been published in New York Mag, Artsy, Art News, Garage, Vice, ID, Notion Magazine, Boston Art Review, and the Art Newspaper. Uh, specializing in contemporary art and the art market. Uh, so where are you both joining us from today? I'm in Brookline. And I'm in Atlanta, not in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Annie, I'll hand things off to you if you want to get us started with some questions. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, off the bat, Pell, I really want to learn more about um, the new pieces you have in the show that you um, made during the pandemic that notably lack the presence of people, which is quite the opposite of your normal oeuvre. So I was wondering if, I mean, I assume that these are cold from Im existing images. Um, and I was just wondering if you could tell me about when you got started with that and um, yeah, just about how that inspiration hit you. Yeah, I think it, I think I started very early in the pandemic going through my archive, the thousands of pictures that I keep uh, from any given older picture. So like the one behind me, uh, they're crowded with people. And I thought I would redo them for the mood. And, I, and I've often noticed that I have really tiny figures and they appear, obviously as I'm going through them, they're usually there in ones and twos by themselves. And it just made me think, well, I'll, I'll try to make empty ones. And it hit, <laughs> and then I had the idea of just leave the people out and there's somewhere I took just thousands of pictures, hoping to capture balls in flight or, or whatever objects were going around. So that really, that really started. And I'd done those a little bit before, uh, but I decided to make a thing of it because I had that time and it was suiting the mood. I wasn't feeling super uh, crowded or energetic at the time. Right. Or, or now either, but yeah. Uh, so then. Yeah, it's so funny. It's funny to look at some of your photos now and it kind of sparks a totally different emotion to see all these this crowds of people. <laughs> now I have like, I have a fear associated with it a little bit. Um, yeah, me too, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, you mentioned this just now, but without like giving away too many of your secrets, I know that when you go and you shoot games, you can come up with like, I don't know, a couple thousand raw photos. So I was wondering if you could tell me about like what your technical process is to make these images after you take the photos, like what happens behind the scenes? Yeah, I, I well, the main thing is to take a lot of pictures and this is one of the most complicated ones. I think I probably took 3000 pictures on that first one. Um, and I wanted to, I back then I did want, even though I didn't do a all balls picture, I wanted to capture the balls because they add atmosphere to my regular pictures. So that was kind of a lucky one that I, I did so many. Um, but the secret is to take a lot of pictures. That's why I was led with that, take a lot of pictures. And back, in back at home in Photoshop, I just go through the 3000 pictures over and over and uh, I look for a pattern, whatever it might be. And with the pandemic pictures, it was easy enough to to find the pandemic, I mean, the, the theme, which is anything that wasn't alive, but was moving, uh, or anything that wasn't human. And in some of my pictures uh, of, excuse me, of divers uh, have 
the divers toss towels into the air. Uh, so anything that's that's inanimate that's up there, there, that's the one. I didn't do an all towel picture, but that would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> And um, it's and like the essence picture that I think we have a question coming, the clothing picture that I, I did. Uh, that somebody has a question on the chat about a future thing. Um, so the technical process is I go through all the, the, the thousands of pictures, find the ones that, that interest me, and then I leave in the little ball in one case, usually with the balls, it's the only thing in that image is one ball and I leave the ball in and omit the rest onto a blank. And it's, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's, uh, I create a blank uh, tennis court and then just leave the balls in in sequence until I've gone through all 3000 and collected all the balls. So, there's something in Photoshop called layers, which photographers will know about. And they are very, I mean, the analog is perfect. They're, they make layers and you can imagine a thousand layers, just the balls, and that's where they all were. So I don't know if that gets to what you were asking. Yeah, and I mean, when you do it with people, you've, you've told me before that um, you never adjust where they are on the field. Is that right? And is that for, like reasons of the shadow or how the light's hitting or why is that that you keep them where they are? Well, it's what makes them feel real because everything really is real in its real spot. So there's nothing artificial about them except compiling them mm -hmm. is artificial, I suppose. Your eye doesn't really see that way. Right. Your memory kind of sees that way. When you remember a game, it's kind of like a mess of action. If you think about it, it's not discrete moments like a still photo. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think I answered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so another question I wanted to ask about, like when you get to these games, you've told me before that like you have to really find the perfect spot in um, an auditorium so that you can get the most action you can see so that every part of the field is actually covered. So I imagine you've been to like a ton of these games before, right? How many, yeah, how many other games do you think you've been to? Yeah, it, I've probably been to I don't know, I have maybe 80 or 90 finished pictures. So I must have been to at least 80 or 90 games and, yeah. and probably more because some of them didn't work out. Right, yeah. And the key, th it's one of the most anxious parts is picking that one spot and deciding, then I'm, I've got to stick with it probably for two or three weeks really, because I'll take a couple of hours worth of pictures. Then I'll be working on the picture for a week or two. Uh, and if nobody happens to run into the spot that I was hoping they would, that I'm kind of, uh, sometimes it's ruined the picture. Sometimes it makes the picture because it's a strange pattern. Uh, but that's a, a, a very delicate point is picking that spot and then saying, I'm just gonna stay at this spot for the two hours. And maybe, I, maybe it's the last lacrosse game of the year and I won't have another chance, so. Right. Um, do you have any interest in shooting games that aren't like amateur or college level? Like, would you ever want to do an NBA game? <laughs> I did an NBA game. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I did it once. <laughs> uh, it's so diff, it, it was the Atlanta Hawks and uh, oh. it's not, the image isn't in the show and it happened to be the first one that I did. Mm. The first pure sports picture because a magazine asked me to do it. And I hadn't, I've had people moving around and maybe playing a game of touch football or kids playing in the park. Uh, but the magazine asked me to, to photograph an NBA game, and that was like a revelation. Oh, I can just have all sports. People mm -hmm. move. And to me, the excitement was everybody's moving around. There's action everywhere all the time. I don't have to, when I did my previous series out on the street, selected people, I just had to hope somebody would come by and something interesting would happen. And that's part of the excitement of that. But, I, but sports let me... Uh, guarantee that there'd be some excitement. Right, totally. Um, and this is something I haven't really heard you talk about, but I'd love to know more about your relationship to color when you shoot these images, because it's something that I've noticed that um, often it's like two or three colors because of, I don't know, the field plus the uniforms, but I don't know. 
um, other ones have a lot more gradient. <laughs> um, well, I mean, part of it's the nature of sports. They wear uniforms and they're in predetermined colors, but I really like it. And I, I, it's a trick, I suppose it's a trick or a compositional habit to alternate the colors or to be really conscious if the one behind me, it's red and green and red and green. And yeah, and this one is a good example too. It's all, all red and that, that was a real decision. I just, that deep green and the particular red was really important to, uh, an important factor in, in making me like this scene. Uh, so it's, it's really important. It's the kind of thing it's hard to talk about, but I'm always conscious of it. And I would love to know what this particular combination of red and deep green means, but, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so what, what keeps you interested in capturing motion? Well, it's, it's kind of, I think it's tied to my basic urge to make art of any kind, which is, and I think it's formal. And I just have, it almost feels like inside, you know, somewhere in my chest, an anxiety or urge to create these complicated things, uh, these complicated compositions where everything's moving and maybe floating. And it really is kind of like, it, it feels like a pre-existing template or ideal that as I developed these sports pictures, I realized, oh, that's, that's the kind of thing I want my pictures to look like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you've referenced Edward Moybridge and Doc Edgerton as some of the people you look to or as inspirations. What do you like about their work? Well, it may be that I don't like them so much as I recognize that they were doing, they did versions of what I do. Mm -hmm. I, the time, they stop time a lot and Moneybridge kind of accumulated time. He did the famous stop motion pictures of a horse galloping across the, right. uh, and he kind of accumulates a second of a horse's gait and mine are kind of let it all accumulate for an hour. So it's, I, it's more recognizing that there are precedents and that I was kind of carrying on a, a little bit what those guys were mm -hmm. doing. For inspiration, it's more, more painting. When I was first putting a lot of figures together, I, I looked at Poussin and like Guernica, Picasso's Guernica, uh, just to see how painters put together complicated figures. And of course they work kind of in the same way. They take a long time to put their compositions together. They work on a figure here and then maybe decide when it should be here. They probably paint the figures at separate times when it's like a big history painting. Uh, so that, I, I thought that was really, it was really helpful to look at those kind of paintings. Um, and then later on, I, I wanted my pictures to be more and more complex and complicated and confusing, uh, like some of the most complicated diver pictures. And there was a show of Dana Schutz at the uh, ICA Boston mm -hmm. that really helped me a lot. I, I said, oh, well, she can smash things together and it doesn't have to make sense. And up until then, I think I tried to make the physical, it, make it physically possible uh, for the action that you see in my pictures to have happened. So you could pose individual people like in the, the one behind me, you could get a hundred people and pose them and it would look like that. Yeah. But I was really interested in like at the complex part at the top of this diving picture, it, that just can't happen. They are all occupying the same space like a Dana Schutz painting. And I felt free because like, well, if she can like make nonsense, uh, well, why not try it? And, and that really did, and not just Dana Schutz, there are a lot of painters who've kind of taken the figure and turned it inside out and showed you different sides, uh, you know, not, not cubistically, but more, uh, I don't know, cartoonishly or something. Right. And you probably have the words for, for those people. Yeah, uh, I, that, that really helped. Totally, yeah. I wonder, I mean, a lot of what I love about your photos are the facial expressions of the athletes because I think it adds to kind of like the painterly aspect of it. And it reminds me, like, it's funny you say Guernica because it, it feels like a war. <laughs> um, so I wonder if, how much that plays into which figures you decide to um, include in the photos and like what, 
I don't know what you seek out in the figures themselves. Is it is it their bodily composition or do you combination of the both or? It's it's the general level of expression and that's kind of yeah. general level of expression of the figure as I'm going through. There are so many where people are just like the doing the blandest possible thing. Mm -hmm. There's no action or energy, you know, even in a game, a lot of games to people who hate sports, you'll know that a lot of games are just people standing around. Right. <laughs> the ball, they don't have the ball, they're just hoping or, you know, whatever. Uh, so yes, the facial expression's key for this one. Uh, uh, not always it's the facial expression, it's, it's the general expressive and that expressive uh, qualities of the figure. And that's what I, kind of confirm for myself by looking at painting. And, you know, of course I noticed in Michelangelo and every Delacroix and everybody, people are often twisted. And I looked for those uh, twisty poses, especially. Mm -hmm. Noticed in yeah. It adds so much to like the melodrama of sports, I think is what it really points out to me, which I really like about it. Cause as you know, I'm not really a sports person. <laughs> no, and that was part of our discussion. And when you interviewed me before and yeah, I'm, I'm on the fence. I, I love to do <laughs> sports. Uh, I, I sometimes watch sports and have been a fan, but I also kind of hate sports. Uh, uh, excuse me, football fans, if there are any, but I just hate football and the militarism and all the commercial, all just the awful parts of it, the spectacle uh, are the stuff I don't like about sports, although I do like the spectacle. Of yeah football, that part I do like, but I also don't like it. So I have very mixed feelings about sports and I get bored if I, I used to be a tennis player and I would watch tennis, but I'd get really bored. I mean, it would only be the very best matches would engage me. Mm -hmm. I basically like it. And I think it ties into my work. I like it because it's connected to the body and it's connected to my body in particular, because I, in, my pictures remind me a little bit of what it's like to move around a playing field, mm -hmm. which is something I really like or love even. Yeah, yeah, and it also kind of satirizes the theater of it too a little bit. <laughs> you think that there's some satire in your work or humor? That's on purpose. Yeah. Well, uh, I like that you said that because it, it, even the lowliest field, like the one behind me again, it, it's not a very thought out, staged looking field. But all these things are set up to photograph. These are little, they're, it's almost one of their primary functions is to be recorded, is a stage to record things. And it is kind of funny because there it's off in the woods and that's a hill and it's in the middle of nowhere. But here's this stage that's filled just a couple of hours a week maybe. Uh, right. So that part, that part is a little bit funny to me. I also love all those spaces of sports, like the college sports, maybe, and professional sports. Just the the structures and the fields that are laid out are really. I just like looking at them. They're homely sometimes. Sometimes they're theatrical, like a NBA arena. Sometimes they're homely with the ugly aluminum bleachers. Uh, I kind of like all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but beyond that, though, I think that like another thing that I really like about your photos is that like some of them, and I know that you said that this is one of your favorite photos is of the water polo. It's like, it captures this moment that like could happen. Like everybody in that photo has their own little space of pool, but like the, the chaos is still captured because the moment right before it and right after it or would just be totally insane, like utter disorder, utter chaos. So I wonder how much like disorder and chaos, like entropy are themes that you think about and work with. Yeah, all the time, especially since I'm working with time, I'm basically kind of doing time. Entropy is a natural thought to have. And uh, and the order and disorder, I, I remember when my my kids were little, they loved it when I would like make a sand castle with them and it would be fun and everybody would be happy and then I'd smash it suddenly and <laughs> burst into, into giggles that you could destroy something also. So I definitely, uh, I try to have more chaotic images. Well, this is maybe my most chaotic 
and I try there's to another, there's another water polo one where it's yeah. like yeah this one where everybody like has their own spot in it it's it's as though you like captured the one perfect moment of like complete organization <laughs> and uh, like no sorry no go ahead well I was gonna say uh uh that's a lot what it's about is capturing sort of many perfect moments all at once and I I always have this thought that it will be cumulative. It'll add up to something more. More if I add enough uh, expressive moments or interesting moments or funny moments, it, it'll really add up to something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wrote that um, you like how patterns hint at the infinite, and I was wondering if you could say more about that. Yeah, in a way, it's a, like a literal-minded comment because you could imagine this, why not repeat it like it's wallpaper, it could go on. You can see that in theoretically, if you had a big enough pool or you could go on forever. Uh, but I, I also think these sort of overall patterns are a little bit cosmic. It's a little bit like uh, Jackson Pollock or something. Any, any patterned thing can keep repeating. And I, I always found that sort of thing moving. I, I used to like pattern decoration painting, for example, kind of for that reason. Uh, had a lot of repeated flower imagery, which I liked okay. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it was, I guess it's really the repetition. And that's always an important thing in all kinds of contemporary art is repetition. I didn't know that you have a painting practice. Do you still paint? I, I painted ineptly for a while, so uh, I, I paint. I started painting on my photographs in the eight, in the eighties, and then I started doing some painting just on its own, based on photographs a lot of the time. But uh, it's not anything I'm would show to anybody. <laughs> it's not terrible, but it's not good at all either. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> okay. Well, um, some. <laughs> uh, is, the, is there any other medium you could see yourself wanting to work in besides photography? I, I really like to write. Oh, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Or just wanting to return to that you have before. I, I like to write. Mm. Uh, if I'd been, you know, other circumstances, I might have taken writing seriously. Uh, I've written some, I, wrote, I was aspired to write some reviews for a while and I, I prefer expository writing or nonfiction writing. Uh, never really wanted to write fiction or anything or yeah. poetry. I've dabbled in a lot of different writing, but. Cool. Uh, so yeah, that's the answer is probably writing. It would be nice to try humor writing, which seems like the hardest thing. Right, that's what they say. Well, I have funny ideas and it's like, I'm think for a second how to do it and I'm totally stumped. So I don't even know. <laughs> it's so hard to get the, a funny tone without being obnoxious or. Right, yeah. Um, something else I, I read is that you, um, your, the drawings that, that your mother made when you were a kid are pretty influential to you. Um, can you tell me about them or what, how yeah, they? Yeah, that's really interesting. It's all this, the compositional things that I'm talking about, this urge to make whatever it is, this ideal thing in me or this, I don't know what you would call it, but uh, I think my, my mother was an artist and she went to the Art Students League in the 30s, I think. And, and she developed a, a style that was a lot like Picasso's line drawings. And actually, should I run and get one of her paintings? Please. Yeah. <laughs> <Wait a> second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Here we go. <laughs> oh, cool. So, wow. And her, her drawing style, that I think that was probably from the 40s when she was a young woman. Uh, her drawing style kind of evolved into Picasso's line drawing style, and she often drew people floating in midair. Uh, like Chagall figures maybe, but done in a Picasso style. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think I liked them at the time through my youth. Uh, 
Uh, they seem kind of old fashioned, but it occurred to me when the more I was drawn to these people, like my favorite pictures are probably the ones in water and pole vaulters, people in the air. Uh, and it's just like my mother's imagery. So it, it was a kind of a shock, but a pleasure also. Like I felt guilty that I didn't like her work so much <laughs> as an arrogant teenager and young man. Uh, and then I was kind of glad now that I kind of, that it was influential. Kind yeah, of what, are, what are the similarities you see as far as the composition or? Well, not so much, that wasn't a good example. The, th the things that I'm talking about look like this diving picture. She drew mm -hmm. people floating in midair. They often have their arms outstretched and uh, flying or floating through the air. Meanwhile, people would be on boats below the figures. And she would also would use an overall composition too, where you know almost every part of her drawing was kind of equal in weight. There was you know not a central bit of action or or a dynamic composition either. Mm -hmm. uh, so I found it very very kind of <laughs> without knowing it, there I was influenced by it. Can we see the one you brought out again? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Cool. Wow, I love the eyes. And you can imagine that the drawing, even, even in this painting, it's really half a drawing. So uh, she drew much like, you know, if you imagine that a thin, even line, mm -hmm. that's how she drew. Totally. Well, are we almost at the time where we ask questions? Because I see there's a lot of questions about the mom's painting and other things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> questions um, so we can transition over to that if you'd like cool yeah um that sounds good to me yeah i'm happy happy to all right um so the first question um people are asking how long the process usually takes to make one photo well it takes the day of photographing it of course and then it takes 20 to 40 hours or even 80 hours in the studio so it, uh, the longest one would take me a month, the very longest, maybe that water polo one I worked on for a month. Uh, typically it takes two weeks to, from start to finish, 40 or 80 hours. And yeah. I often do a version and then give up on it, start again or you know, change things. So it, it, uh, it takes a while, but that's typical, two weeks, week or two weeks. Great. Um, and then someone asked, what do you do to avoid shadows moving across the frame as light changes over the course of the shoot, um, other than uh, shooting under consistent lights? Um, so nothing. Uh, I, I don't do anything. It, it, it's, I let it, I mean, that's the way it happened and that's the way it appears. If you're a fanatic and you want to measure the angle of shadows when you get sharp shadows in some of my pictures, you'll see that they move and I, I just let them. Uh, sharp sunny shadows are much easier to deal with because they're defined just for all you people wanting to try it. <laughs> when you have soft shadows, they're much more, you can't see them, but they're there uh, on a cloudy day. Like there's an aura around people that I never saw but it's a little darker near your legs and uh, very subtle shading that very difficult to see. But I see when I work on the pictures. Great. Um, so we had a really interesting question too um, about racing or circuit sports like the Kentucky Derby or NASCAR. Um, have you ever considered doing anything like that? I've considered doing every sport on the planet. <laughs> it's uh, it's not always easy to get access. So anytime I can get access, I would probably try it. Uh, somebody, uh, a magazine tried to get me to do golf for a while, then another one did and I finally did golf and I thought I would hate it, but I liked the picture. So uh, I would really try anything because one thing that keep back to Annie's question earlier is what keeps me doing it, is all these uh, highly patterned activities, in other words, sports, uh, they don't look the way I expect them to when I do my thing on them. And it's always kind of a surprise that people move in the way they do or 
or like nobody ever goes in the corner in a lacrosse game or uh, stuff that it's not that I care about it, but it's just interesting to see that these things, human activity falls into these patterns that are very difficult to see unless you collect them in, in this way. There are probably other ways to collect it. You know, you could make notes, but. <laughs> Is there one sport that you could foresee being like the hardest? Well, I thought it was tennis because there are only two people and I don't like to have one person repeat infinitely, but I was wrong. Uh, I would think maybe cycling because there's no different gesture. Mm, that makes sense. You, you might let your hands leave the handlebars, but there's not a lot of range that people do. So I, I would kind of expect to be wrong if I photograph the right thing where there's always something interesting. In an hour or two, what I've learned is there's always something interesting that happened. Right, something unexpected. Um, so we had another question. Are you inspired by repetition occurring in the natural world, like the Fibonacci sequence? Well, I'd like to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> it would sound elegant, but no, it's not something I know about or, or have thought about much. And then where do you see this series going? Um, especially thinking in terms of the pandemic right now. Well, that's, that's really difficult. If I pretend there's no pandemic in the cards, uh, I'd like to photograph dancers and maybe actors on stage mm -hmm. and maybe even take it a step further and get a choreographer to uh, imagine some new gestures to photograph because I maybe I want something new to photograph, new combinations, new gestures, and maybe actors could think of some strange new faces to make or, or also gestures because actors are good with their bodies. So that would, that, I don't know if I'll end up doing that, but I've been thinking that about, about that during the pandemic. That's something I'd like to, uh, I'd also like to do more sports, but if uh, that's how I'd like to expand what I do. Great. Um, a technical question. How many Photoshop layers go into each photo and how large are the files? <laughs> uh, the, well, that water polo picture prob or, uh, probably had a thousand layers, wow. maybe 3000 pictures. And the file, I don't know, is two gigabytes or something. Photoshop has a weird way of calculating things. I'm not sure what, what that means, uh, but that's the technical answer. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and then we just have a lot of comments saying they love the work. Um, they yeah. love the work. <laughs> um, and then does the COVID context change what you're feeling when you're making the work um, or how you think the viewers experience it? Yes, well, Annie, Annie said that, and I, and I think you get that even on TV. When you turn on any new movie or show, you say, why are they so close? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure people feel that way when they see people that close. Uh, it's changed my feeling about sports. I, I kind of don't think people should be out there without masks playing professional baseball and the rest of it. So it, it just makes me feel, I, in a way, I'm itching to go out and photograph more sports but I wouldn't do it. I, well, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it, but I would not be enthusiastic immediately if somebody asked me, you know. Uh, so it has changed my feeling like in that super concrete um, pseudo political way. Yeah. So it would have been really awesome to see a Pellcast photo of this year's Super Bowl with all the dancers that were really spread apart <laughs> yeah. for the halftime show. That would have been awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, artistically, I would love to do yeah. <laughs> all of those things. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to be at the Super Bowl. Right. Yeah. True. And it's interesting thinking about it, too, in terms of like, I don't know about you guys, if you're watching movies right now and you see someone without a mask on and you're like, you take that moment. Um, but then it's a little different looking at these photos and these photos of the crowds because there's that like impossible sense of like, nobody can be in that 
existing in that plane at the same time. Mm. So it's a little bit different. Um, it is. I'd like to go out and do some some plazas and street scenes with masks and because I, I don't really, I haven't gone downtown my, at all. I haven't been out a field very much at all. So uh, that would, that'll be really interesting, you know, if I get my, my vaccine soon or something. Uh, I'll be interested to see how, what differences there are, if, if I can see them, if there's, so that's another thing I would do if, uh, when, it, when I'm free to go around more. Right. So have you been shooting recently? Well, a little bit. I, I, I had advance notice that somebody asked about the Essence photographs I did. Essence is a, a website and a clothing company. And so they sent, they, uh, they mailed me a bunch of clothing, beautiful, beautiful clothing. And I tossed it up in the air and took pictures of it and then put them together in the, the same fashion as the sports pictures so that there was tons of clothing in the air. Uh, so I've done a few things like that where people have sent me things or uh, I, I photographed the, the record holder of the cannonball run, the cross country auto race mm -hmm. for GQ. They had him, you know, they kind of made him come over and I stayed far away from him and took pictures and did a picture of his car, did a funny picture, a yeah, composite picture of his car. So I've, done, I've gotten a few things from outside myself uh, to do like that. And uh, I'm working on a couple of other clothing toss type things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've done those things. It doesn't, uh, I don't encounter anybody or hardly so, and I don't yeah. go anywhere for them. So yeah, that makes so sense. that's been really nice, but I missed being able to do what I wanted, exactly what I want to do. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always did come to think of it. I mean, it'd be nice to run around doing exactly what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yep, those were the days. <laughs> um, all right, so someone asked, so there are ways that we've collectively decided to represent time in still imagery, like just one frozen moment. How do you see your work challenging this standard or presenting an alternative um, to the dominant modes of seeing? It's a good question. I think that single, uh, that single instant thing is bullshit. <laughs> uh, that there's more truth to be had if you have more photographs. It's more like the way your eye works. It's more like the way your memory works. Mm -hmm. uh, it's truer to, my pictures are truer to a game than one still picture that represents maybe the drama, like a, the twisted face of he's just lost the game or you know something like that. And I say it a little facetiously, but, uh, but I also kind of mean it. There, there's something really distorting about, much commented on, but there's something extremely distorting about a still, a single still image of any kind. Uh, it's not the way your eye works. It's not the way your brain works. It's, it gives it its mystery. It's what makes photography really interesting, uh, but it's not so related to the truth or to the document or any of those things that photography has a reputation for. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, have you ever considered applying that to like portraiture or anything? Um, I have done, I have done it. Uh, should I run and get, get a portrait? <laughs> yeah, sure. I have no idea you've done portraits. <laughs> You're right though. <laughs> cool. Oh, whoa. So that represents, this is from a series called Strangers. Uh, that re represents a hundred photographs maybe of this one person's face uh, 
but put together completely wrong. So it doesn't look like him. It's no longer a portrait of him, even though it's made up entirely of him. That's so cool. So yes, I have. Uh, and there, there's a little bit, the, sorry. We have someone in the chat actually saying that they had their portraits done by you last year. Um, oh. <laughs> experience. Ah, hmm. Oh, not, oh, Jeff, yes, I see. <laughs> oh, Jeff. Yes, I did some portraits of him, but I don't have them around. But uh, anyway, I do do portraits. It doesn't have, I'm not sure it engages the element of time so much. Uh, it's a little bit of maybe non-identity, which you, a person can be sort of anonymous if you take them little bit by bit. Yeah, it's like those those series you always see online of people that take a photo of their own face every day for a year, and you like <laughs> like slightly over time. All in one photo. <laughs> yeah, and then just like smash it. <laughs> Um, and then you have uh, the series Strangers. Uh, someone says, it's a big departure for me. Um, do you plan on doing more like this? Like this? Uh, I like to do them whenever the, either somebody comes by who kind of wants to do it. I mean, it's sort of ongoing. I would do them anytime because I really like it. Um, I did one of the race car driver, which I really liked. It didn't end up getting published, but I was really glad to add it. So they're not, compared to my other work, it's not as huge a commitment of time to do one. So I really like doing them when, you know, whenever, whatever this circumstance arises. It's not something I'm working on every day to try to finish a series. On the other hand, you know, it's, it's just adding to it. Um, and then another question, have you considered moving away from the expansive and into the intimate? So something like a kitchen or a living room rather than an expansive field or a sports stadium? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what I would want actors to do. And it might be in front of a set and they might be able to do some really interesting contradictory emotions. Oh, that's the other thing about this. Speaking of actors, I wanted to, face to actually contradict itself. So looking in one direction or maybe feeling sad on this half, but happy on this half. Uh, and, and that's something I would like to do. I don't know that I want to set up in a kitchen or a living room. There's a long kind of tradition of stage photography that does that. Um, and I try to stay away from things that I, I myself find too familiar. Um, which is not to say that they wouldn't do it because it's not a bad idea, but uh, photographing actors seems like what I, uh, the thing that I would do in place of that. Yeah. Um, all right, and then for the last question, um, could you describe your printmaking process? So you do, do you make your own prints at home, um, in your studio? I make, I make most of them at home. I have a, a a printer that goes so big, not not enormous. And then I have an outside printer who does the larger prints when I need them. Um, it, I'm good at adjusting them. So they, I mean, the, the actual pressing of the button is not really printing to me. It, it's adjusting the picture so it looks right. And then it almost doesn't matter what printer the ones I get back from an outside printer always look just the way I planned. So uh, I'm sure there's a lot more to printing than, than that, but that's how it works for me. It's not a huge uh, area of expertise or effort or, it, I mean, they work really well the way I, I'm happy with them. Yeah, um, and we are too, obviously. <laughs> we have a bunch of gallery right now. Um, all right, so we're going to wrap things up. Thank you both so much. Um, this has been really great. And thank you all for joining today. Um, Pelcast Crowded Fields will be on view at Abigail Olgavy Gallery um, for anyone in the Boston area until March 21st. Um, you can pop in anytime, Wednesday through Sunday. We're open. Um, but thank you both. Thank you.
Thank you. And thank you, Annie. Yeah, thank you, Phil. <laughs> All right. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.